say is have a lawyer draft your retention agreement. Don't try and save a few pennies and draft it yourself. Uh, your, your lawyer is not going to want to uh, practice your area of expertise and you shouldn't practice law. You will find, find it uh, significantly rewarding if you will allow a lawyer to draft your agreement. But the first thing you need to discuss with your lawyer, you need to know what the law provides, at least in the state of California, for expert witnesses. And you should bring any questions about this to the lawyer drafting your agreement. So this is why I prepared this handout. The, uh, the statute that you have here, that I've given you, is every statute you need to know governing expert witnesses. We begin with 2034.210, and it, it's, I'm not going to discuss it except to give you the reference, this is how uh, the law that provides for the retention and calling of expert witnesses. You need to know the procedure where attorneys designate experts. This is the law that governs it. The next section is 2034.260. And you'll see that the attorney in the designation has to include one, two, three, four, five things by declaration. Let me focus on the fifth thing. A statement of the expert's hourly and daily fee for providing deposition testimony and for consulting with the retaining attorney. The attorney that, you, that hires you has to know that information. So you need to know that, that information. You need to have a specific fee for each of these uh, for uh, providing deposition testimony and for consulting with the retaining attorney, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. The next section is 2034.270. I'll just read to you, starting at the end of the second line. All parties shall produce and exchange and place in all the dates specified in the demand all discoverable reports and writings, if any, made by the designated expert described in the designation. That means you have to have a report. That means you have to give the report to your lawyer. But some states or some cases are in the federal state they don't require a report. This is correct. Let me address the state law. Um, even if you haven't yet served as an expert in a state case, I'm sure you'd like to get another case tomorrow. So let's assume that uh, you need to know the law even if you haven't yet had to, uh, or had the opportunity to testify in the state court. But it's safe to follow what the lawyer says, right? Say again? It would be safe to follow. They say you don't need to report, then you don't need to report. That's correct. That's safe too. That's correct. The next section is 2034.300. Beginning in the middle, the trial court shall exclude from evidence the expert opinion of any witness that is offered by any party who has unreasonably failed to do any of the following. And let me focus on the last two. Police reports and writings of expert witnesses under 2034.270 that we just read. And D, make that expert available for a deposition. So if you refuse to be tested, to be deposed, because you're too busy, if you don't produce the writing, when the opposing attorney says, time is up, you're not going to be able to testify. And if you're not able to testify, if you're excluded, who do you think is going to pay your bill? You have to be prepared to produce your writings and to be available for a deposition. Now, we all know the realities of and constraints on our time, and particularly physicians, in my experience, but it could apply to each of us, um, have very busy day jobs. And they'd like to do their forensic work after hours, at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. I've taken depositions at 10, 10.30 at night. But I didn't want to. <laughs> and if you are in the position of trying to force that, you may just end up being excluded as a witness. So bear that in mind if you uh, I think Saturday is the best day for depositions. They aren't. Section 2034.310. 
let me highlight section B. This is calling an expert that was not previously designated. And your, <coughs> your testimony will be very limited to impeach the testimony of an expert witness offered by any other party of trial. This impeachment may include testimony as to the falsity or non-existence of any fact used as a foundation for any opinion by any other party's expert witness, but may not include testimony that contradicts the opinion. Do not fall into the trap of thinking that you're only going to be a rebuttal witness, you're the stopgap measure, that you're going to be able to testify beyond saying, well, the other expert didn't have a foundation for his opinion. That's as far as the judge is going to let you go. And if in your uh, misunderstanding of that, you and the lawyer believe that you can go beyond that, once again, you may have a problem collecting a fee at the end of the day. I remember a case I tried a long time ago where I called an expert witness as rebuttal and his testimony lasted about 30 seconds. It was not pretty. Um, section 2034.410, on receipt of an expert witness list from a party, any other party may take the deposition of any person on the list. That means you get to be deposed. And you don't get the chance to say no by agreeing to serve as an expert witness and be designated. You can't say, but I don't want to be deposed. Because once you're on the list, you can be deposed. The next section, 2034.415, an expert whose deposition is noticed shall no later than three business days before his or her deposition produce any materials or category of materials, including <laughs> any electronically stored information called for by the deposition notice. I can't tell you how many times I've taken the deposition of an expert and he said, well, it's electronic, that it, the, the answer to your question is electronically stored. Fine. Where's your computer? Well, it's right here. Well, crack it open. You gotta give me everything. The point is, you need to be prepared for, in advance, that you have to produce everything electronically stored. And that means every email you have with the attorney, every email you have with the client. Yes, sir. Does that include threads? Do you have to just all the repeats on it, just absolutely everything? You have to produce all electronically stored information. That doesn't imply that you have to duplicate what you've already produced. One of everything should suffice, but everything. Yes, ma'am. Do you find people utilizing thumb drives or other tools just to start printing hard copies? Yes, I do. And the problem is that a deposition, if the uh, attorney doesn't have a computer, um, you're going to get into an argument over, well, now we have to go find a computer to print out what you should have brought, and you want to be paid on the clock, and the attorney is saying, no, you should have printed, have it in a, in a format that I can see. It does me no good to have something I can't see and question you about, because the whole point is to question you about it. Yes, sir? But you have to be submitted three days in advance. Uh, three days in advance is different. the law, but I can't tell you how many times, that I think that's observed more in the breach than in any other way. So you'll show up for the deposition and then the uh, the records had better be there in readable form. Yes, Kim. Mr. Jensen, knowing all of these rules, how can these experts and what items should they talk to their lawyer about when drafting the agreement? How can they address some of these issues when drafting their agreement? And, and I think the best answer is and that, that any of the things that, that are in the, in the rule book, in the statutes, that you have a problem with, that you think makes you uncomfortable, you need to address that with the lawyer in drafting the agreement because there are workarounds. Like you were just saying, sir, about producing it three days in advance. The um, lawyer that hires you would love it further in advance than that. So obviously you can uh, finesse that in your retention agreement. So anything I'm saying, anything that you find in here of concern to you, 
It's something that you should address with a lawyer that's drafting your agreement so you can perhaps uh, have the agreement drafted that's best for you. Yes, ma'am. Is that rule different across states? Because many times it's been discoverable and other times it hasn't been. Again, if you just go by what a lawyer will let you know, or how do you safeguard yourself in certain states that have worked across the country? Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm only licensed to practice in California and in the federal courts here in California. So I can't address Arizona or Utah or Hawaii. The point is, for California, these are the rules you need that govern. And you don't have to like them. And they don't have to be the same as Arizona. But the point is, these are the rules in California. And in drafting an agreement, particularly if you're using one across state lines, you may want to have your lawyer answer that question. Say, I anticipate having cases in every state, all 50 states, or in Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon, and California. Please investigate the law in these states and provide it to me. That would be an excellent question to pose. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a particular type of lawyer? Um, I mean, like if a lawyer called me to testify on a case, I'm not going to use him to draft that agreement, I take it. Is there a particular lawyer that drafts this type of agreement? And aren't, are there standard agreements that can be modified? Uh, the answer to your question is no and yes. There is no particular specialty in drafting expert retainer agreements. Any lawyer that uh, uh, drafts contracts, any transactional lawyer ought to be able to draft a contract that will govern your retention. And uh, uh, there are certainly other people's forms that you can modify, but let your lawyer do that, not you. Let's move on. Because we're coming up to the most controversial part. Um, CCP 2034.415. An expert shall. Oh, I'm sorry, we covered that. 2034.420. I think this is probably the most controversial section, with, or tied for the, for the most controversial. The deposition shall be taken at a place that is within 75 miles of the courthouse where the action is pending. Did you all pick up on what I'm getting at here? So most of my work is out of state. They always have come to San Diego, and I never requested it. The, the reason that it's common to take expert depositions in the expert's office is coming up. But the, the person that makes the choice is the attorney noticing the deposition. On motion for a protective order by the party designating an expert witness, and on a showing of exceptional hardship, the court may order that the deposition be taken at a more distant place from the courthouse. Wait a minute. It says more distant place from the courthouse. Let's say the expert's office. There's a more distant place from the courthouse, not a closer one, but the expert's office. The party designating, uh, the party noticing the deposition is the one that picks the place where the uh, deposition will take place, whether you like it or not. And the next section. covers payment. So let's turn over to the next page and start with B. A party desiring to depose an expert witness shall pay the expert reasonable and customary, customary hourly or daily fee for any time spent in deposition from the time noticed in the deposition subpoena. Well, that's all right. It means you get paid from the time that you're supposed to start. C, if any counsel representing the expert or non noticing party is late, to skip ahead, he has to pay for your time. That's not right. Uh, but then we have D. Notwithstanding subdivision C, the hourly or daily fee charged to the tardy counsel shall not exceed the fee charged to the party who retained the expert. So that means you cannot have a different fee schedule for one side or the other. Same fee applies to both. And does um, 
we are to written in section E. A daily, a daily fee shall only be charged for a full day of attendance at a deposition or where the expert was required by the deposing party to be available for a full day and the expert necessarily had to forego all business the expert would otherwise have conducted for that day. Experts frequently like to charge by the half day or the day. That's acceptable. But this is the limitation. You've got to convince the lawyer paying the bill that you necessarily have to forego all business that day. Now we come to the next section, which explains about where the deposition will take place, because it says who's going to pay for your travel time. The party designating an expert is responsible for a fee charged for preparing them for the deposition for traveling to the place of deposition and any travel expenses of the expert. So you're hired by a lawyer in the case. He has to pay for your travel time and for your cost to travel to wherever the deposition is. Your retainer agreement needs to provide for advance payment of that because the law does not. The law just says he should pay. It doesn't say when. Your agreement can provide for when, but it cannot provide for the other side to pay that. The law says that the lawyer that hired you has to pay for your travel time. So, a deposition is in San Diego, and your office is in San Diego, that's one thing, but if he's making you come up here, then, or if the other side is making you come up here, then the lawyer that hired you gets to pay for your time on the on the freeway driving up here, and back, and any time to prep for the demo. Many experts, in my experience, make the mistake of saying, well, the, the other side should pay for that. No, it's contrary to the law. And now, uh, we come to section 0.450. The party taking the deposition of an expert of an expert witness shall either, that's a very important word, either, accompany the service of the deposition notice with a tender of the expert's fee based on the anticipated length of the deposition, or tender that fee at the commencement of the deposition. What's that? They don't have to pay in advance? They don't have to pay in advance. They don't have to pay. I have a case right now that's coming up for trial and I had to school my expert orthopedic surgeon. He says, well, I have to go up to Los Angeles from Laguna Beach for my deposition. That's half a day round trip. I want the defense lawyer to pay in advance. No, I'm sorry. Can't make him pay in advance. Now wait, isn't there another section that addresses this? Don't go away. Don't go. To conclude this session, however, in subparagraph C, if the deposition of the expert takes longer than anticipated, the party giving notice of the deposition shall pay the balance of the expert's fee within five days of receipt of an itemized statement from the expert. Now, most lawyers bring a blank check to the deposition and they ask you your EIN and they will write it out then and there. In fact, maybe even put it on the record that I'm paying you a check for $20 million. Well, whatever it is. But they don't have to. And if you're there, and he says, okay, send me a bill, I'll pay it within five days. But when, you know, I, I thought it would be an hour, I brought you a check for an hour. He's entitled to do that. And the, the deposition is over, there's nothing you can do anyway. Yes? You can say that you charge a half day rate, but remember the section we just read. You have to justify that you gave up business to be here half a day. Now, one way you could justify that is if the deposing attorney had stated in advance that I want half a day of your time. Okay. That makes it easy. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure I understand the 
Five minutes. The service, next section. The service of a deposition notice accompanied by the tender of an expert witness fee described in the preceding section is effective to require the party employing or retaining the expert to produce the expert for deposition, but turn the page. But, section B, if the party noticing the deposition fails to tender the expert fee, the expert shall not be deposed at the time unless the party stipulate otherwise. Well, wait a minute. I thought we just said that they had to just bring it. These seem to be contradictory. I have attached in the last page a recent case here in Los Angeles County in front of Judge Walt Troy, um, where he addresses this exact subject. And if you'll turn to the, uh, the end of the case, third paragraph from the end, the court could exclude Dr. Gunstler's testimony due to the unreasonable failure to properly include all the information required to list him as an expert and make him available for deposition. Next paragraph. Nevertheless, the court notes that a certiorari's primary request for these motions is to complete discovery by taking the deposition. Under the circumstances as explained above, the court finds good cause to exercise its discretion to grant the motion to compel the deposition of Dr. Gunstler. Therefore, the motion to compel the deposition of Dr. Gunstler is granted. So the court resolved the issue in the manner that makes the most sense, in my view, and is fair. The court said, yeah, he didn't give a check with the deposition notice, but he was ready to pay you. Go give the deposition and get paid. Our time is up, but let me, let me reiterate that especially these concluding issues, about payment and time and place, duration rather than time, I should say. These are all things that can be addressed in your retainer agreement, at least to some extent, and you should definitely seek uh, legal advice um, as to any of these issues or anything else that the law uh, I've given you here covers. Thank you. Yes? Yes. I don't have anybody else out here, but I do my own. I don't have the time that puts my agreements together. Who, who, who would we utilize for that, that knows this well enough? Ask an attorney that you've hired, that's hired you before, using your own agreement. Say, John, you know, I want to have uh, an attorney draft up a retainer agreement for me. I don't want to practice law any more than he wants to practice that, you know. He wants to practice my specialty. Can you recommend somebody you went to law school with or had dinner with last night? You'll find somebody. Thank you, ladies and
seen an expert ask us to sign a retainer. So this opened up most you experts. Has to sign a we have not seen in our practice experts signing retainers. An example is Dr. Landau. You're kidding. You're kidding. That, you're kidding. that happens that all the time. Yes. You can't even begin without a retainer. Yeah, I, that's why it was a surprise to me. So uh, what I did was I, I thought about what it is you all really want out of the and I think what you want is you want to know what the time scope maybe is going to be. Most of all, well, you want to know that you're going to get paid. And everything after that is, is sort of cream on the cake. So um, when we built this PowerPoint, you'll see there's, a, there's a, a set of little topics. These were the kinds of topics when I went through the literature for what a retainer ought to have. These are the kinds of topics that you might want to build in your retainer. But not every retainer needs them all. Now on the, the specific question that Candace put to us is how can an expert protect credibility in the contract and avoid the appearance of being a hired gun? I don't really think that's a, a function of a retainer agreement, which is to get you paid. I don't, I don't really think you protect yourself uh, particularly in your contract from looking like what you are. You're an expert. Yes. I would like to add that, um, that I do, and my attorney suggested that I have a statement that says that my opinions have nothing to do with uh, my payment, the fee, or you know, any other outside wow. factor. Excellent. So, Excellent. That's, and it says on the fee schedule and also in the retainer agreement. And in the report. And in, the report. in that too. And in the report. Um, that's an excellent point. The other point that we all discussed when we were planning this meeting is escape clauses, and that is if you feel that you're being put into an untenable position, if you feel that you're being put in a position where the attorney is writing the report and the opinions that are contained in it are not yours, you have to have uh, in your contract grounds to withdraw from the engagement. And on that subject, I wanted to bring up a uh, body of law that's growing now around the country. Mr. Jensen talked today about the, the CCP, those are the state court rules in California for experts. There's also criminal rules that are different and uh, federal rules. And some of you are asking questions about the federal rules. Much less discovery, by the way, of your work product in federal court. Your draft reports are not discoverable in federal court. The communications with the attorney that engages you are not discoverable in federal court. That sort of snuck up on people. It's a good thing to know. Um, but this body of law that's building around the country and it's kind of coming to a head now is where the attorney writes the report for the experts. The books will tell you that's okay. I'm going to tell you that there's a bunch of judges out there that will not tolerate that. They call it the avatar report. <laughs> because the expert is being put up as the avatar for the attorney that's trying the case. So I, I'm not sure that's something you want to build into your, into your uh, retainer, but your idea might solve that problem. In my opinion, the expert is working for the client, but I think other people believe that the expert is working for the lawyer. When you read the opinions of the court, the appellate opinions, they tend to associate the expert with the party not the way we're calling it. Um, yeah, but that, it's a real problem if, if, if you're trying to explain to a lay person why you need to get paid before you go into a deposition. Well, right, and it's a collectability problem. My partner has a lot to say about collectability. He's got some tips, so you guys can be sure you get paid. Um, but you're right. I think I think your engagement has to be with the law firm. They'll because always write in that the client is ultimately responsible, and that's what I think tricky is that I try to write into my contract that the lawyer is responsible at the end of the day if the client is not pay, it's ultimately their responsibility, but they will always seem to try to push it off to the client. So it just depends on where you're at in the day and 30 days after you complete. And that opens up the whole issue about contingent fees. Can you agree to defer your compensation until the end of a contingent fee case? I don't think that's up to no. the well, We have an ours that uh, payment of my fee is not contingent upon the attorney being paid by any other party. So that's that's in the contract. I think that's appropriate. I think that belongs in the contract. So did I answer your question? I
really interesting listening to everyone who described your particular expertise because there's a really great diversity in this room. And what's funny is that the cases that Elizabeth and I have worked on over the years, I've used arborist, I've used uh, construction defect, I've used toxicologists, financial, forensic. I mean, we've probably dealt with 90, 95% of the type of experts in this room because of the type of work we do. So I have a lot of ex uh, experience in dealing with building relationships with experts, gaining their trust, and this is what you as an expert want to know. Can I trust that lawyer that I'm working with, particularly when you've met him for the first time? How did he find you? Was he referred by another lawyer? Did he find you through your uh, reaching out to you? And one of the things I've found in working with experts, like with Joe, for many, many years, is sometimes I have experts that I've worked, I trust with a long time, they know me, they call me when they get contacted by new firms, new attorneys on a new case, and they say, Brian, what do you think? Do you know this guy? Do you know this firm? Are they up and up? That tells me, number one, this is an expert that's concerned about his credibility and is concerned about, am I going to have a good business relationship with them? And I, am I going to get have trouble down the road? So, protecting your credibility is number one. Know who you're dealing with. Don't hesitate to reach out to lawyers you've worked with in the past. Call them up and say, do you know anything about this lawyer? They may be able to help you. So outside of the retainer agreement, I was just going to run through some points very quickly, stop me if you want to talk about them. But these are things I've thought about in my experience in dealing with experts where I knew that this would be important for them and the case. Number one, when you're retained, regardless of what your field is, you're being asked to answer a question for them. You're going to be offering opinion testimony. Spend a lot of time with the, uh, the attorney. What is the question you're being asked to answer? That is so incredibly important. Understand it, discuss it with them, and then if you have to, you go back a second time and a third time. I've had experts that I've dealt with who I trust, very, very highly accomplished people, they spend almost as much time on that topic as they will anything else because they say it's so important. I want to know what you want me to answer because the slightest variation or tilt on that could have them going off in a different direction. And that helps your working relationship, so now you've got the trust. Know the facts, and this is part of this when you get to know a lawyer, have these frank discussions about the facts, good, bad, and indifferent. If you find a lawyer is always trying to sugarcoat things, it's a red flag. And so these are the sort of things that could possibly put your credibility at stake in, at the time of a cross-examination of a deposition or a trial. So you want to know the bad so you've got the answers for them later. So make sure you probe and are comfortable probing with that attorney what those bad facts are. What is your burden of proof? I've had endless conversations with experts about what the burden of proof is. Now this is kind of a legal question, but it helps them understand how you frame your answers. Because defense lawyers and plaintiff's lawyers on the other side are expert at asking you questions in a way where they're getting at your substantive opinion, but they haven't framed in a way that it has to do with burdens of proof. How, what standards are you applying and how you developed your answers? And they know how to tuck all of these key phrases in there. So you kind of have to learn some of the legal jargon. And again, this helps protect your credibility when now you're at stake when you're being deposed or, or being testified in court. Um, Admissibility challenges also. In other words, you're going to have to, and ultimately, if you are a testifying expert, your admissibility, all of your work, everything that you've done over years, all of the effort you've put in working with Laura, ultimately has to be tested for its admissibility at a time of trial. So you have to know, as well as the lawyer does, what are the admissibility standards so you know when you get to those hearings on challenges, you know how to Develop the right answer to satisfy the court that you did have a rational methodology, that it was reproducible, that
that it was coherent, that it was based in the literature for whatever your particular field is. Anytime you can base an opinion and say, I've done the research on how other experts approach this particular answer or this particular problem, I followed that approach, it's well-founded. That adds to your credibility. Stop me anytime now, I'm just running through all of these things that... <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> and stop me, stop me when I've taken up my time. One more minute. One more minute. Okay, I'll go through one more. Here's one. Consider working as a non-disclosed non expert. If you're in a case where you're not so sure about what you're getting into, or if it's an issue where you're not really confident, either about the firm or whatever the work is, you can have an initial proposal, and I've done this with experts. And particularly with medical experts, I'll say, look, we're still working this out on the case, what the facts are, what the legal challenges, whether or not you can help me. Let me retain you as a non-disclosed expert, and any time I have a question about your <coughs> particular field, I can call you up, I can go to your office, and I can learn from you, and he's, he's, you're, you can be a source of knowledge without necessarily having to be called to do a report, give a deposition, and testify. I've got other points, but I'm going to wrap up. Anything? Good. There's a question. That's a good question because that has to do now with disclosed ex experts having access to other disclosed experts. Now, some lawyers don't like one expert speaking with other experts. They think it's cross-pollination and it looks like collusion or whatever. I, I completely disagree with that. If you're part of a puzzle that a legal team was putting together presenting a case, you want to know where you are in that puzzle. It's like a freight train where there's a there's one box car here and that one's is fitting this piece together and you fit here and there's somebody after you in it. You want to know how you fit in this picture. So you want to be able to talk to other experts. But what about non-disclosed experts, they will ask you in your deposition, have you spoken with other experts? So you have to be careful if you're the, uh, if you're the expert, non-disclosed expert talking to another expert who is disclosed, that could be discoverable. I'm talking about the attorney talking to a non-disclosed expert. You can be a useful source of information to the team without ever having to go the full way of going through litigation. It's just another option. Question over here. Is there, uh, is there uh, a difference between a non-disclosed expert and an expert consultant? Well, uh, not really. It, it really has to do more with the context of litigation. If you're, if you're in a case that is in litigation, you're, and you're working with the lawyers, you're a, you're a non-disclosed expert, and but a, a consultant could really be working with, uh, with an attorney or a team of attorneys on an ongoing basis, even without litigation. And many times, you know, I work with Joe on these, I call him up and we have lunch, and I have other experts that I say, I'm thinking about a case, am I getting into something that I should? And we sit down, and sometimes I will retain an expert as a consultant to even decide if I want to get into the case. But, uh, but a consultant uh, uh, is not, uh, can't live to be a testifying expert. Can a non disclosed expert live to be a testifying expert also? If they're timely designated, sure. If it, in other words, if the lawyer is happy with you doing and you're happy with him, and maybe somebody else falls out of the case, he says, gee, can you step in? And you're comfortable with it, and what, what you're doing. You can then become a disclosed expert, and that goes through what we just heard on the statute, timely designation of an expert, all of your qualifications. If you meet those statutory deadlines, you can become a disclosed expert in your office of crisis. I was going to make a quick comment that um, a few cases I've been on where the high profile or big numbers in seven digits. Um, I brought on another expert along with me, and that kind of tied them up, too, so that my team had a nice team of experts, and then the other side was able to, because there were several parties being named. It was a nice way of making sure that we had all the best experts.
always good to have yeah. strength in numbers and other points of view. Totally agree. Did you become uh, a, a designated uh, expert, but you were a consultant in the past. Is everything in the past discoverable? If it's on this case, and it's work that you did that's part of the opinions you're going to be offering on the record, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's open. So I think it's clear that uh, you need to make sure your uh, fee agreement, your retainer agreement is very clear what capacity you're going to maintain. Um, and I think also that taking away from the list that I got is that if there is a schedule. I have a 
fee schedule that I that is outlined. I have a, a fee schedule for uh, LA County, have a fee, a fee schedule for the state of California, and have a different fee, fee schedule for outside the state of California. So all that stuff is outlined in my fee schedule, so it's there. One of the things that the, that the opposing council always tries to get to, not always, but tries to get to on, if I'm being deposed in California, and, uh, and the case that's going on has happened in, in, like, say, New York. Well, they try to give you California rates. It says, no, this is a New York case. We happen to be in California, but I'm going to charge you New York rates. So the thing is that, you know, be careful with that, because they'll come with a check for California rates, and then it says, no, you a little short. I will send you a bill, and uh, they will they, 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 they get that correct. Go ahead. Yes. Is there a listing of rates for different states? I thought you as an no, expert. No, no, outside of the state of California. So how would you know what your rate would be in New York versus LA? Well, my, I have a certain uh, rate for cases that are in California. I have a certain rate for cases that are in LA County. Then I have a certain rate for states that are outside of California. You but, define those, sir. Huh? You define those rates. For That's, I define those rates. And they're listed on my fee schedule. And then, uh, we'll talk about it. I'm just curious how your New York rates are different. I'm just telling you, if anything outside of California, they, 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 those yeah, rates are those exactly. rates. Okay, I, I just picked out a state. Any questions on the Rule 26 report? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated that you list the cases when you were deposed or when you were described. So many of the cases now settled. Are you expected to list the cases that you were on that were settled or only the ones that you were deposed? Because they can settle after you write your draft. Right. I just list the cases I was deposed on and testified in. And that's one case I listed on that list. Can you list the uh, other cases? You can, but I think the requirement is that you want to know what you testified in, and, and by deposition and trial. So, right. so that's what I do. Well, the reason I'm asking for in some specialties, you know, 90% of the cases settle after the draft opinion. Okay. Well, then you have a very short list. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very short But say in your deposition, I talk about that. So there are certain cases that I've handled that are not listed, and these are not cases I've handled, but they, they may have settled after I wrote my Rule 26 report, so I wasn't deposed or, or I wasn't uh, testified in trial in those cases. Yes? My understanding of the reason they want to know the case information it's because the attorneys want to be able to go look and see what their opinions were and what you said, make sure, see where they can trip you up. So also, um, I'd say 99% of my cases in the last 10 years have uh, settled outside of court. Yeah. So it's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me say this, and that's, and, that's, and that's correct. You have some attorneys that will do a thorough vetting on you. I just had a, a case in Arizona, an attorney had uh, cases on me that I, I had forgotten about. And, uh, and uh, so the thing is that, you know, your, your testimony has got to be consistent. For those of you who do interviews on, on the media, your, your interviews have got to be consistent with your findings that you, that you testify in court and in depositions. A lot of experts, they, they go way out here in left field or, or, or somewhere else, and then when they, they testify on both, it's a whole different venue. You've got to remember that you're not an advocate. You're not an advocate for anything. You're an expert. And your and your expert, you know, your statements or your findings or your 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 discussions in those areas should be consistent in court and out of court, and that's important. And that stuff will come back and bite you. Go ahead. In the Rule Twenty Six uh, case in Boston, I was asked to produce a report at the point of disclosure of my name as an expert in the case, which of course was many weeks ahead of. Uh, well, the, many weeks ahead of the trial, and uh, it was a rush. Is is that in Rule Twenty Six, or is that was that the judge that I was dealing with in Boston? It could be the attorney. It could be the attorney. The thing is that you know, a lot of times the a lot of times the attorneys will not these to express here. <laughs> a lot of times the attorneys will sit on on the case to the last minute. And they will call you, and then you know some some of some of you some of the experts have um, uh, expedited fees or reports. So the things they they'll wait for at least three or four days out or to a week and call you. So these 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 schedules have been 
been, been discussed and have worked out between attorneys, and they've been, they've been in place for a while. So we, like, a lot of times we get these calls in the last minute, the attorney's waiting until the last minute to call you. I, I couldn't find a little bit of you know, internet search for Rule 26, which was tedious and uh, mind-boggling. I couldn't find anything that said in Rule 26 that a expert report is due at the point of uh, designation of the expert. And you won't find it. The, uh, thing, the thing is that, and, and the attorneys will, will either will, 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 will confirm that, they, they, they work out with this deep date with the court and the opposing counsel, and it's in writing. Am I correct? And, and they, they, um, you know, they get their experts, and they say, okay, the, the Rule 26 report is due December 20th, and, and they, they, you, you be, they be retained in, in September. So you have, you have two months, two and a half, almost three months to work on your Rule 26 report. Some attorneys will call you a week before and say, uh, can you have, I mean, I want to retain you in the case, but the, we have a short turnaround, and we need to report by Monday. Well, that's not a short, they, they knew about the turnaround for some time, but they just waited to the last minute to get you involved in the case. Yes? I'm not clear on what Rule 26 is. Is this for federal cases? For federal cases. Okay. I understood that we had to have a report turned in 90 days before the date of trial for federal cases. That's what I've always been told. Counsel? And I just got told that two weeks ago for a case in Georgia. What I can ask that? Most, if Virgin's here in Central District, each judge will issue a case management order. The attorneys get the order from the judge, and then they're the whipping boys for the rest of the case. It's usually a timetable set by the court. But anybody that's got any questions about the rule, it's actually federal rule, so the procedure, <coughs> rule 26, and all the things that Tim was talking about, the, the contents of the report, they're actually bullet points in the rule. It's, it's, it's not hard. It's just a little tedious coming up with it, but um, once you've done one of them, the others are gonna be a piece of cake because most of the ingredients of the report are gonna be the same over and over. The only thing that changes is the specifics of that of that event, and you'll keep updating. I gave a deposition last week. You just keep updating that. Um, I wanted to mention a really good source while we're at it. If you're in federal court, this is a publication at the Federal Judicial Center. It's online for free at www.fjc. That's Federal Judicial Center, fjc.gov. And you go to their publications. Uh, tab menu, and it's called the Reference Manual on Scientific Evidence. If any of your specialties fall within the, the disciplines that are in the Reference Manual, it's it's the most valuable thing we've ever had. We regularly ask our medical experts to follow the cookbook. There's cookbooks in here on what the expert ought to be saying and how we how to get over what y'all probably heard of as dogger. California and Sargon, the admissibility issues. You've, you've been dealing with this yeah. your whole life. The cookbooks for the scientific and engineering and mathematical disciplines are right here. And it, what was the beginning of that uh, website? The Federal Judicial Center, it's F as in Foxtrot, J as in Juliet, C as in Charlie. Dot gov. It is the official website of the federal judiciary, which includes the Supreme Court, all the courts, the, the federal courts of appeal. And these are publications that they put out there to help to help you all and help us. So you can see this is probably the fifth version of this one that Brian has had. Um, he beats them up because he takes them with him everywhere and they <laughs> fall, <laughs> fall apart. <laughs> I downloaded, there's some newer versions, but the newer versions don't really replace the older versions. They add new disciplines. So right now, this volume deals with engineering, regression, medicine, DNA evidence. Is um, there a number to that? Um, you want second edition? If you want to get the best one, get the second edition. Second edition, okay. There's editions afterwards. The second is the best. Hmm. This one is aimed for you guys. The, the later editions, are aimed for lawyers that want to exclude him. So, so um, we don't like those. We like the ones that help an expert get his report out and bulletproof it. Because 
that's, that's important, you all. If your offer is an expert and you get excluded, it's kind of a thing that sticks around for a long time. You never want to happily be excluded. You always want to be admitted in a better report. And this is a uh, kind of a reality check to help you get there. I'd like to say one thing. Uh, for those of you who want to get trained in, in Rule 26 report, I advise you to go to a SEEK conference. And uh, that's, where I, that's where I got my training at. That was in Rhode Island about 10, 12 years ago. You're coming to San Diego now. Okay. And, and I, 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 I strongly encourage you that they, that's what they focus on. Yeah. You learn, and then the format is what I gave you, and they have a book out on Rule 26 reports. So the thing is that go there, learn how to write your reports, and, and trust me, you'll never get challenged in that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Williams. I'm sure those hands are There's so many things to keep in mind when you are drafting your fee agreement. Think about what kind of case you have. Is it federal? Is it state? Do I need to modify it? Don't just use the same retainer fee agreement for every single matter. Look at it. See what you need to do. Do I need to put some timing requirements in? Um, get to know these rules. Okay, so for our last five minutes, and then we're going to have time for questions and answers. I'm going to bring Paul back up, Paul Jensen, and he's going to talk to you about how does an expert witness get paid? Okay. Thank you. Well, the first thing is submit your bill. No bill, no money. The point is, uh, and we were talking about this at lunch, um, very often a case, uh, the trial concludes, and we have a very short time frame to file a cost bill. We need to know what our costs are. And if you don't send the bill, we can't submit it. Send the bill early and often. Early and often. Don't let wait until the bill is 100000 and then send it out to the lawyer and expect to, to collect every penny. It's early and often. Um, I've only not paid an expert one time in my career. And that one time, the expert changed his opinion as he walked up to the witness stand. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how, how uh, uh, difficult it was doing that. We still won the case, but we won significantly less than we should have if he had stuck to his opinion. His expertise was human factors. So I would, the advice I would have is tell the attorney what you really feel, not what you think he wants to hear. The better you know the lawyer, the harder that's going to be. But we need, we lawyers, we trial lawyers, we need to know if there's a problem in our case. And it, I don't want it sugarcoat, give it to me straight. Even if you think I don't want it, I do. I want to know what you really feel. And the tendency in human nature is we want approval, we want to get along, so we want to tell the guy that's hiring us, this is the fifth time, you know, I want a sixth. I want to tell him what he wants to hear. Well, he needs to know what you really feel. Telling him what he wants to hear may tend to present problems in payment time. Great information we got. So we have one minute each, the panelists get one minute to give us their, their takeaway on drafting the fee agreement and what they want to know. And then after that, we're going to open it up to
and I have to decide, can I live with that budget? And we can talk about the budget. Sometimes there's a little bit of an agreement, and you know what you're getting into, so you're not surprised. So that's another thing to think about, is doing it in increments and in budget. Thank you. I've talked a lot about uh, state law, and uh, I don't mean to exclude federal law, but my feeling is that you should be prepared to testify in both courts, and your agreements should be satisfactory for both courts. And these are things where um, the person sitting next to you may need a slightly different version or a slightly different tweak to it than you do. So please go hire a lawyer to draft the agreement. Goodness gracious, it'll save you so much heart in the long run. And do get a written agreement signed. Do what? Do get a written agreement signed. One of the things that, uh, that's important for me and my groups to do a lot of traveling is that um, when, I, when I travel somewhere, I don't want to be staying at Motel 6. And I put that in my in agreement. I, I specifically state Motel 6. And um, um, I like business hotel Marriott High or whatever that is, and so that the client will know when they, they make arrangements for you that, uh, that they will make arrangements in those, in those hotels. Um, I, I, I like business class travel, and I, I've been fortunate so far that when I do travel, I do travel business class, and uh, whatever range they have with the airlines, they, they, they do it, and they, they don't seem to, to, to fall. But the thing is that you know, you've got to, you've got to do that. Um, also, um, your, your range for portal to portal, um, so you can include that in there so that when they get the bill, it's not, it's not a, a shock to them. You got to be very clear in your retainer agreement of what it is. And these are and also your mileage. Your mileage has to be IRS rates. You know, don't be seventy-five cents a mile. I think IRS rates right now is fifty-seven point five, fifty-seven point five cents per mile. So you look up what IRS rates are, and then you put that in your that's your, that's your mileage. Uh, so don't go crazy go on seventy-five eighty cents because you then turn to eighty. Fee she is smart. They won't pay you that. We have about five more minutes, so if anybody has a question, I'm going to take two more questions. If anyone's question is specific to how to draft an agreement, then I'll have you answer it. Otherwise, our panelists are going to stay around for a little while, and I encourage you to come up and talk to them about some of the issues that you experience, because um, so I think they'll be here for just a, just a little bit. So anybody have a question about how to draft an agreement? All right, you've been a wonderful audience. Great question. I want to say thank you very much to Elizabeth Trump. Such knowledge and information. Well, I didn't do anything. I just answered questions and monitored the room, so I'm all monitoring. But thank you so much, everybody. And please stay around, ask your questions, and come on up. Thank you. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. So thank you for being an amazing moderator. Amazing, spicy, hello, and thank you. Thank you guys so much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, we want to, we uh, on behalf of the Forensic Expert Witness Association, um, I would like to just really say thank you to each and every one of you because it takes time. These guys are busy, productive attorneys that really support the Forensic Expert Witness Association in this way so we can be educated and continue our careers. And that's what we're all about. Continue to be educated so we can be certified so we know when we go out there, we're the best that we can.